Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. So we're going to talk about 21st century. That is the century we're in, right? Right? Okay. 21st century uh, corporate community involvement. OK, so imagine that you work at a Mittelstand. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, OK, good. That's the only German I'm going to say. So got that out of, out, of, out of the way. Now, like most companies, your, your employer has a corporate community involvement program. Um, and the definition of a corporate community involvement program is basically a formal company-supported effort to proactively go out there in the community and help with societal causes. So the societal causes might be poverty or education, the environment. And it's true that most companies have this. Um, research that I did through the Boston College Center for Corporate Citizenship um, this was part of the Bank, Bank of America sponsored this. On Fortune 500 companies found that 92% of these companies had a corporate community involvement program that involved employees. Um, and in Germany, I don't have any, I haven't done any research in Germany, um, and I'm not familiar with the statistics, but um, most of your companies probably do something there too. They either have a, a formal way for employees to do something in the community or they have a grant program, or they have an in-kind giving program. Those are the three main areas. So while this is a common thing, and this, your, you know, your fantasy employer here is doing something customary almost at this point in history, it, it's, oops, what? <laughs> that, OK, I'm having technical problems here. Um, so while a corporate community involvement program is a common, is a common thing these days, um, the state of affairs is that we are in infancy in this. Most programs are very moderate. So one of the, one of the things that we learned from the Fortune 500 research, for example, was that over 90% of Fortune 500 companies involve uh, only a small minority of their employees in the community involvement. So over 90% involve fewer than 50%. And over 90% of these companies involve their employees less than 16 hours a year. So if you think of all the hours in the year and all the employees that you have, what's customary is that um, is that you know over 90%, what's customary is that you're involving employees really occasionally, maybe one day a year, they go out and they you know, dig holes and plant trees or clean up a riverbed or paint a fence. One day a year they do that. If you look at the financial contributions, what we know from the US is that companies on average give less than 1% of their profit away in part, as part of their community involvement. So while it exists, it's, 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 it exists at a small scale. Compared to the size of the corporate sector, corporate community involvement is at a very moderate scale. But the company that you work for is, um, is, is it's a fantasy company. So we're going to say it has a fantasy corporate community involvement program. So at your company, every employee is involved every single week. Not once a year, but every week of every year, they are doing something for the community. OK, that's, that's at your fantasy company. And the company's not giving away 3 quarters of 1% less than 1% as US companies do, but it's, it's investing 10% of profit into its community involvement. So this is a huge investment compared to what is happening out there right now. So you might think, um, OK, that sounds, that sounds ridiculous. That sounds infeasible. That sounds absurd. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of company executives. Um, think this when they first see this. Uh, but what I will say is that, yes, it does sound a little bit absurd. Uh, but bear with me, because I'm going to quote a very smart German here. And you guys already saw the quote. But if at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. So what I'd like you to do is to 
uh, take that concept that, that this is absurd and set it aside for a moment. And bear with me, because I think in, what my job, what I propose to do in the next half an hour, is that you leave here with hope for this idea. Not just distant hope that your children's children maybe will get to this, you know, a world where it's true that at, at, at a typical company, every employee every week is doing something for the community. But to leave that there's hope that, you know, by the time you guys are in your mid-careers, this is true. And for hope, not just that, um, this, that, that this is a good idea, because you might also be thinking, why is this a good idea? And I'm going to convince you why this is a good idea, I hope. Um, not just hope uh, that this is a good idea, but also hope in these concrete steps to getting there. So, this person here is a, a professional environmentalist. He gets paid to um, help the environment. And what he is doing here is he is protecting these wildlife corridors for this endangered mountain goat in the United States. That's a really wild thing to do. But that's not the wild thing he does that I want to point out. The wild thing he did, in my opinion, is that he is the person who was on the sales floor of a clothing store and sold me my snowboarding outfit. So yes, you heard that correctly. So you have a professional environmentalist selling me my snowboarding outfit. So. What, who paid him? Who's paying him to support the environment? Well, it turns out that his employer is. So he works at -na -na -na. Mm -hmm. Patagonia, OK? You have one here in Munich. So at Patagonia, it's at Patagonia, you cannot be the person that says, you know, it looks like you're a medium and the blue looks better on you. You know, you cannot be that person unless you fulfill this. This is a direct quote from their job description. So they are defining the shopping experience as, you know, being able to help people with the product. That's what they do commercially is sell this, sell, uh, you know, clothing, um, as well as environmental involvement. So Basically, his job is to do that, as well as to sell the product. At Patagonia, whoa, this might be a very quick lecture if we, if I, okay, so at Patagonia, Every, so these, this is the workforce, this is not assigned to the men's room, which I realized later that it kind of looked like that. But, this is, a, this is the workforce, at, the sales force at Patagonia. So every employee comes in there to do their, the commercial, the purely commercial side of their job, which might be to learn the new procedures for how, um, how to handle returns, to do the paperwork, to understand the new products, to like figure out what the new spring line is and what the prices are and you know, f learn how to fold things and all of that. But they also come in as stewards of the environment. This is part of their job. So at their job, they're also learning what, uh, what happened at the park when it flooded and you know, is the stream in danger? Um, you know, uh, what are the new things going on with recycling? They might, um, they might start a new petition to you know, stop drilling in a sensitive area. They might um, start a new program in the store to help people understand recycling. So at Patagonia, every employee every week is doing community involvement. It's part of their jobs. Every employee, every week. Well, there's probably one that won't. So, <laughs> and you probably know who that person is where you work or where you go to school. So, of course, there'll always be an exception to somebody who won't do this. But virtually, Every salesperson at Patagonia every week is doing community involvement. 
So we already see a con and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, you might be thinking, well, I, this doesn't make sense to me. And, it, and it, you know how commercially and environmentally these things come together. And I'll get to that in a moment. But the point I want to make right now is that already this absurd statement of spending, you know, 10% of profit and having every employee be doing something for the community every week is reality somewhere. It's reality down the street. So this is possible. That absurd statement is possible. And it, we can make it happen in more places. But only if we're willing to do one thing. And um, I'm going to do a short demonstration here to show the one thing, OK? Because you guys have been sitting for a while now. OK, so uh, just play along with me. There's no right or wrong answers. Just have a little bit of fun. Just relax with this. OK, so all right, everybody stand up and find a partner, uh, OK? So now, take something off that's on you. You know, it can be a pearl ring. It can be uh, glasses. You know, use your imagination. Whatever you get, put it on, OK? Whatever you get from your partner, put it on. All right, anybody want to show off what they have? Very nice. Very oh, very nice. Okay, that looks lovely on you. That's <laughs> that's great. Very nice over there too. Okay. Okay. You guys look great. Okay. All right. I'm gonna ask you three questions. You you can answer yes or no and just shout out your answer. Okay. Does it fit? No. <laughs> kind of hit or miss. Does it bring out the best in you? No. no, not really, okay. Does it does it serve you as well as it serves them? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah? okay. Yeah. Okay, kind of hit or miss, right? So what do you think happens when we take the concept of charity, this beautiful concept of charity that grew out of civil society, and take it and move it to the, work, to the workplace, to the corporate world. What happens is that it might not fit well in the corporate context. It might not bring out the best that the corporate sector can do for society. And it's probably not going to serve society as well from the corporate sector as it serves society from within civil society. So this is the one thing that we have to be willing to do to get to the point where we're investing s substantial amounts of money in corporate community involvement and where our employees are spending every week doing this. We have to be willing to leave charity in civil society and not try to honor it in the workplace. Because if we just try to replicate it, if we just try to keep it altruistic, to keep it voluntary, to keep it whatever the employees are really excited to do, to keep it unpaid, all of those things are charitable by definition, uh, then we, it won't fit the context well it won't help as much as it could, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's a misfit in the, the corporate world. So we have to be willing to design something that's radically different from our history. The, the, the reason, the main reason I see that corporate community involvement is at the, you know, a minority of employees occasionally taking part of it and only you know one percent of profit at the most being spent on it is because we can't let go of this concept of charity. We keep insisting on charity. Okay, uh, whatever you got, you can keep, and then you can go ahead and sit down. doing charity, okay? We're doing something, we're starting with the blank slate. What is it that a company should do to have really effective, really powerful corporate community involvement? So the answer 
And this is the highest level answer, by the way. I, I mean, I teach this for you know days and days, so I'm giving you kind of the tip of the iceberg here. But the answer, and it's very important to start with a blank slate. This is what Peter Drucker, you know, the uh, management guru of, guru of the 20th century, he invented management um, theory, um, said um, c called planned abandonment. So we have to abandon all our concepts of charity, of volunteering, of philanthropy, and design something from scratch. So we're going to do planned abandonment here. We're going to just abandon all those thoughts. We've got a blank slate. What do we design so that we get to that point where absurdity is not absurdity any longer? So the two things. The two things we need to make sure are true at the highest level are first on the vertical axis that our corporate community involvement program integrates into the business functions. So the reason we needed to integrate into the business functions is that as long as we consider this something separate, so as from the core of what the company does. So if the company is out there you know, developing these amazing products, they're very uh, technical and specific, and then you know, they help clients use these products, and they do all these incredible things, and they manage employees, and they train people, and they do all these, and they move things around, these very awesome uh, accomplishments. And then on the side, there's this program, and it's the Corporate Community Involvement Program. And uh, we just write some checks, and, um, and we organize two events a year. As long as they're separate, then it, this can never grow to scale. This can never be anything substantial, because no company can afford to spend resources on something that is not productive. So the reason to fold it into the business function, and it's not just fold it in, it's fold it in in a productive way. Fold it into the business function is in order to, um, in order to uh, make, it make sure it serves the business. So there goes altruism, remember, let all those things go. So that it serves the business and therefore can be a large program, can be every employee every week doing this. So in the Patagonia example, it's obviously integrated into the business. So right, it's, it, the, the sales representatives have as a job description to be environmental stewards, essentially, to be involved in environmental issues. Uh, anybody have anybody know or have an idea on why this would serve the business? Why? How does this help Patagonia? Anybody familiar with Patagonia? Anybody? So Patagonia, what they do is they sell you the clothes to go have fun in the environment. They sell you the gloves that you're going to use to climb that iceberg. They sell you the boots that you're going to use to kayak down that crazy river. They sell, you know, they sold me the, the snowboarding outfit, the, you know, that picture's from Colorado. So that's what they do. They have to know, I mean, they don't have to know, but if they really want to serve the customer well, and their, their, their products are not cheap, so they, they better be serving their customers well. They want to serve their, their ultimate consumer well. They have to understand their product where it's meant to be used. So one way to make, I don't mean to be breaking things here. One way to make sure that every single salesperson understands the environment in which their products is used is to make sure that they're out there doing things. So when I bought the, the, that jacket, uh, it has a hood, and I was asking about the hood, and he said, do you wear you know, gloves you know, with the fingers in the pen, or do you wear mittens? And I said, I wear mittens because I'm always cold. And he said, OK, well, if you wear mittens, uh, here's my experience. The hardest, you're going to have to take them off, and the most, the most, the hardest part is to get this loop through here. So do that first before your hands get cold, and then once your hands get cold, you can do the rest. It's okay. So the only reason he knew that was because he had been out there in the environment doing that. And I was probably going to buy that jacket anyway, but if I wasn't, that sort of 
customer service, kind of really understanding the product would have probably pushed me over the edge and I would have bought it. So at Patagonia, you know, the other thing is that if, if, if I decided, you know, I'm going to go to the store here and get a pair of, uh, of hiking socks, they would be able to tell me where to go hiking. So they understand that, that, that their clientele is out there having fun and they understand what, what the outdoor activities are and what they can do. So that's how Patagonia does that. Um, the other thing you need to do, so what you want to do is be in the top right quadrant. I'm sure you guys have seen zillions of two by two matrices, so you figure that out. So on the, on the horizontal axis, the other thing that needs to be true about corporate community involvement in order to be impact maximizing, so in order to do the most good possible for the community, is that it needs to draw on the, the assets, the, the strengths, the capacities, the particular um, uh, you know, physical assets that the company has. So Patagonia, one of the things that, that, you know, one of the things the world needs is a lot of education on the environment. So, you know, we need, we need to learn to change our light bulbs and turn lights off and recycle and to pick up our, after ourselves. I mean, it's a very long list of things that we, that the planet, that humans need to learn about the environment. Most of us do not like walk into the Sierra Club or something and say, what do you have to teach me today? That just doesn't happen. And we probably don't even go to their website. But Patagonia has people that come into their stores all the time because it has you know, a pretty front and you know, people are shopping. And they're like, we have a captive audience. We have foot traffic. We have people that come in here. And we need to sell them, the, the, the environmental movement needs people to uh, sell them the idea of being environmentally responsible. So when you go into a Patagonia store, it's not just retail space. They have used this store to make it a, a, an educational experience around the environment. The other thing is that they have salespeople. Salespeople can sell things. They can sell ideas. They can sell change in behavior. So the only reason I know that there are wildlife corridors that you know animals use in migrating and that it's a problem, at least in the United States, because there's development and then the corridor gets shut off and then you know, the animals can't get enough calories here and can't reproduce there and all of a sudden you have an endangered species. I had no idea there were wildlife corridors. I mean, it makes sense, but I had no, no idea that, that there were such a thing and that you could actually reestablish them. I learned that in a Patagonia store. So they have used their, their, they have used their, their, their retail space and their sales expertise to help with a societal issue. So that's how Patagonia is in the top right. It's integrated into sales, it uses the retail space, it leverages that, and it, it also uses their ability to sell to get up there, okay? Okay, so this notice that this looks quite different from the traditional philanthropy, charity, volunteering, um, all of those things that were created in civil society. So first of all, I'm talking about a win-win return here. This better help Patagonia. Um, this is not altruistic any longer. Um, second of all, you know, it might be that the neighborhood in which Patagonia is um, has a problem with vandalism. That might be the most important issue in that community. But that's not what Patagonia is responding to because they're responding to what they can do best, what meets those two criteria. And this is also very unlike the charity model. The charity model is that you know, if, 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 if there's a hungry person and they need food, you are charitable, you give them food. So this is a very different, different way of looking at things. Also, this is not about employees. Patagonia does have a program that does a little bit more of this, but, 
But the, at least the program I'm sharing with you, the one that's in the top right, this is not about employees doing what they are passionate about, what they are most interested in doing, and giving money there, and then the company giving money to where the employees give money. It's not a personal uh, decision, and it's not something that you know employees are doing on their private time, and that the company won't pry because it's their private time. This is very, very organizational, very strategic, very professional. It basically, it's within the confines of running a business. It's not part of people's private lives. So this is a very different model from charity. So this is why I was saying, you know, we, we have to start with the blank slate and be willing to let go of charity. Now, don't get me wrong. I really love charity. <laughs> I don't want you guys to think, oh my God, she's a monster. She doesn't like compassion and charity and feeding, you know, hungry people. I love charity and I do all those things. I, you know, I, I give money to the thing that pulls my heartstrings even though I haven't even looked at the organization to make sure that they'll spend the money well. I, I, I am sort of the, 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 can be the most extreme person in just acting out, out of my charitable instinct over something more thoughtful and strategic. Um, so I love charity. But I think it only works well in civil society. And what I like even more than charity, and it's the reason I get up every morning and I help you know, these companies, you know, HP and Levi's and Disney, these companies do this, is because there's something that I love even more than charity. And that is solving the world's gravest societal problems. So I think if we want to solve the world's most grave societal problems, we have to be willing to not be charitable in the workplace, but instead to be very strategic. So I gave you the two things that are primary to do. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more. Um, which you know, I don't really have time to cover, but if there's two things to take about what a corporate community involvement program in the 21st century should have in order to be maximizing its impact on societal issues, it's that integrated into business and leveraging business assets. Um, I'll just say that there are some publications out there. Uh, you've already heard about the CCCD. There's a, they published a paper called The End of Employee Volunteering um, that I wrote last year. Um, and it's, it's, it covers this in more detail. And also, if any of you are members of the chamber here, the American German Chamber, there's a chapter in here that covers uh, um, this strategic community involvement some more. And there are publications on the Boston College Center for Corporate Citizenship. So I'm, it, it, the, I realize that I'm only covering sort of the tip of the iceberg here. And by the way, whatever challenge you think might happen when you try this, like, well, but employees are going to hate it, um, or the nonprofit partners are going to hate it, the NGOs are not going to like it, it's going to be hard to explain. That's true. All those challenges exist. <laughs> so um, the, it's not that it's easy to do this. It's not that it's easy to do this ma impact maximizing corporate community involvement. It's much easier to do charity, much easier at the workplace, but, uh, but it's still worth it. And I'm going to give you some examples of, of companies that have, have, have done this well, so that you can see that this is possible. So I gave you the example of Patagonia. So basically, at Patagonia, there's community involvement that is intrinsically linked to sales. So let's come up with a different example. Um, so Bayer, we'll look at a German company here. So Bayer Crop Science. Now, this is in West Virginia in the United States. So they have a program. Uh, safety is a huge company priority for them because they have, they have toxic chemicals. There are uh, employees who are lifting up heavy loads. They have uh, equipment. They have forklift um, uh, equipment. So you know things can go wrong here. So um, safety is a huge priority. One of the, the key components of their safety program is that it are, are these cards. They're called insight cards. And what an insight card is, is that 
is, is, uh, is basically this card that any employee can fill out at any time, and they're encouraged to fill them out often. And so I might um, uh, fill out a card that says, you know, uh, Paolo didn't wear his, his hard hat when he was in this area. Or, you know, that Jeanette, um, um, she did a really great job of lifting with her knees. And then you just put them in this box. Sounds very simple, but it turns out that this is, this is the, the, the knowledge base on which the um, program thrives, how the program operates. So they take all these insight cards, and then they figure out what's working and what's not, and they adjust the safety program. Okay. The other thing that's happening at Bayer Crop Science is that they're, they're already doing the, the impact maximizing community involvement in one regard. They have a partnership with a, with a, a food organization. And because they had an empty warehouse, so there's an asset that they could leverage and share with the nonprofit. And they have forklift operators so they can move the food around and put it in places. And then they need it sorted into the boxes that, that will then go to the soup kitchens. So employees during their lunch hour can go over there and volunteer and sort boxes. So already you can see that that meets you know, it, it, some of those two criteria. So now here's the stroke of brilliance, and it's so simple, and I give this example after Patagonia because the Patagonia one might scare people away. That's like a really sophisticated, are you kidding me? We'll never be able to like convince anybody of putting community involvement in a, in a, uh, in a job description. You know, that, that's like pie in the sky. The Bayer example, on the other hand, is very simple. So what the safety officer decided was, you know what? If people don't want to fill out the insight cards, we're not getting enough of them, and they weren't, why don't I just say that we will give 50 cents for every time somebody fills one out? Problem solved. So the number of people who filled out the cards went up by like 600%. The next year, they got uh, all sorts of awards for being the, one of the safest plants in, in on the planet. And... All they did was basically take community involvement folded into the safety function in a way that enhanced the safety function and helped, you know, at the same time was obviously helping this NGO. So here's a very, that's a very simple example on how to integrate. Another completely different way to do this. So Aetna is a health insurance company in the United States. They're all about the healthcare system. Blood is very important for a healthy uh, healthcare system. So they do a lot of blood drives in, in their offices. Uh, the other thing that Aetna does is that recruitment is, is a company priority for them because it's very important for them to have a diverse workforce and it's very important for them to choose the right people right at college because people tend to not leave Aetna. So you start working there, you're there 20 years later, you better have chosen the right person 20 years ago. So recruitment is very important. They go to college campuses looking for new hires. They used to, HR, human resources, used to go and talk about the spirit of the Aetna employee and how charitable they were and how great they were. And then they realized, wait a second, if we want to do more for the blood supply and if we want to give students a more realistic view of an Aetna, a real Aetna employee, why don't we have Aetna employees, the same ones that organize the blood drives in the offices, come with us to the college campuses and set up a blood drive? So now the students, when they interview with Aetna, they go and they give blood and they get to talk to a real Aetna employee. And now here is the recruitment function integrated into community involvement. So now you see a completely different type of, 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 in, of um, integration into a business function. So I was at the meeting where the vice president of um, community relations who's in charge of the volunteer program of the blood drives, asked the HR representative, okay, we've done this for a year, it was a pilot, should we continue doing this? And she said, you know, I've been in, in human relations for seven years, and of all the things I've started, this has been the most valuable to us. So that's how helpful it was to the recruitment function. Okay, IBM. 
So <laughs> I'm really usually not this bad at this. OK, IBM. So IBM has a corporate service core. Uh, basically, a priority for IBM is making sure that their employees are really effective in the global environment. So they need global leaders out there. Um, so they designed this program that takes, will take a team of employees. So maybe there's one in Brazil, maybe there's one in Singapore, and maybe one in, you know, in New York. And their assignment is to, is to help an NGO in a developing country with you know, uh, whatever it is IBM helps organizations with. You know, maybe uh, streamline their operations or start a new location or be more effective. And um, they go on site for a month and they do this and they work three months after and three months uh, later. So this is their, um, their signature now leadership development program and it is community involvement. So, and it's the most popular leadership development program at IBM. So now you have integrating community involvement into leadership development. None of these look like the separate program where employees are just pulled outside of the workforce and to do something like paint a, you know, paint a wall or something like that. These are all, you know, look like business. All right, one more example. So this is FedEx, this is another company that I work with. So FedEx, um, in Florida, there are these invasive species of snakes. There's pythons and there's anacondas, and they're not native from there. And you can imagine how much damage they're doing to the environment there. So there are birds that are on the borderline of being endangered, and there's small rodents because they have no protection against these snakes that came from elsewhere. So what non-NGOs need to do is to find these snakes and take them out of the environment. And one of the ways to do this is this, the snakes like to hang out on branches above roads. So one of the things they do is drive these roads looking for these snakes. Well, somebody realized, and this was somebody at, at an NGO, so you can, you can start this from the NGO perspective. You don't have to wait for companies to come up with all these ideas, because it, it's going to take most companies a while, by the way. But um, so you can start this from the NGO perspective. So now this was the NGO who said, wait a second, why are we driving all these roads all the time? There are people that drive these roads already and they're called FedEx drivers. So why don't we train the FedEx drivers to spot these snakes, they see a snake, they pull over, they get out of their truck, they climb the tree, they grab the snake, they climb back down the tree, they take the snake and they go bop, 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 and they kill it, just like that. Okay, no, they don't do that, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, actually, all they do is they pull over, and uh, FedEx drivers, the other thing that FedEx drivers have is GPS. So they know exactly where they are, and they have communications. So they call the NGO, and then they have a wildlife biologist you know, handle the snake. Not in the way I described, I just made that up. Okay, so. You can integrate community involvement into um, moving packages. So you can see that there are many ways of getting up there. And if you, if you think about it, if we take our business functions, if you take um, you know, recruitment and find a way to enhance it with community involvement, the way Aetna does, you take leadership development, safety, um, moving packages, sales. If you take each function and you think, how could this function be stronger in a way that is now doing something for a societal issue? If we do this, then eventually what we're doing is we're solving societal issues from recruitment. We're solving societal issues from sales. We're solving societal issues from uh, moving packages. We're solving societal issues from, you, you get the idea. Eventually, the way that business operates, because it's intrinsically linked to societal good, is moving the needle on all these things. And then what this is doing is 
the, this is roughly the size of these sectors, by the way. Um, so um, the, the much smaller NGO sector, and this is true in the U.S., and the, the government part is very different in the U.S. and, 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 and Germany, but, but this part is not. So if you eventually what happens is that you start changing all of society, because imagine what the, this, the NGO sector would look like if every single classroom were adopted by a department, or if every child had a mentor that worked at a company. Or if, um, if not only every sales employee at Patagonia, but every single employee at 200 different companies was out there helping the environment. Eventually, what happens is that you, know, you get this really powerful NGO sector, not the, the minuscule, even in the US, that we're very proud of our civil society. Well, in the US, if you take all of government, and you take all of the nonprofit sector right now, you put all of that together, this is federal government, state government, local government, the entire nonprofit, including uh, uh, schools like uh, you know, Harvard University, you know, Boston College, I guess I should mention Boston College first. Um, if you mention, you take the entire, all of that, it still adds up to less than 20% of our resources, 20% of our, less than 20% of our people, less than 20% of GDP, less than 20% of, of um, income. So, the way to really grow it, I think, is to take from the 80% and have it really contribute in a meaningful way. So if you think about it, if we do this department by department and we really look for ways of integrating community involvement into individual business functions and leveraging business assets for the good of the community, then what we're slowly doing is uh, making capitalism intrinsically linked to doing good. Now we've sort of materially changed the way companies operate. So uh, I'll just finish by saying that basically what, what I'm urging and you know, what I'm you know, helping these companies do uh, is to realize that the most charitable thing that a company can do at this point, I think in the 21st century, the most compassionate, the most charitable thing to do if it really wants to help you know, children who don't get vaccines, if it really wants to help families that don't have shelter, if it really wants to help eliminate vandalism, clean up the environment, the most charitable thing for a company to do to help with all these things is to be willing to go beyond charity and to not feel itself beholden to the tenets of what we consider charity. And I'll leave you, I know that sounds a little unreasonable, so I'll leave you with a quote from Shaw, which sometimes if you do this, you appear a little bit unreasonable out there because it's like, but this is what employees really want to do. And this is, you know, and, 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 um, and you know the the senior vice president's wife is going to get upset that you know we're not helping cancer any longer. It's like don't you like don't you want to help people with cancer? Well, yes, everybody wants to help people with cancer, but if we just listen to our charitable instincts, unfortunately, we're not going to get there. So even though it sounds unreasonable to disregard our charitable in instincts in the in the workforce in, in, in the corporate sector, I actually think that's the most charitable thing to do, and that's the thing that will help us um, progress forward. All right, so questions, concerns? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bocalandro. Sie können die Fragen auf Deutsch sprechen, dann wird irgendeiner hier im internen Wörterbuch nachschauen, ob wir das Wort kennen und es auf Englisch übersetzen. Or you can ask your questions in British English, Australian English, American English, or Spanish. Come on. Do I have to invent an NGO before I can come to the uh, enterprises and tell them what is my idea or how can I come to any idea like 
you have shown us. Okay, that's the that. fits. Yeah. The idea must fit. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, I hate starting new things if there's something there that can be used. So, and we tend to start NGOs at the drop of the hat when there's somebody else out there. So, um, I, I, I think it's. Uh, there are NGOs that are doing a very good job at presenting like this. I mean, obviously, in all these cases, these companies have NGO partners that are helping here. Um, so I, I would start with um, whatever work it is that you want to do, you know, whatever societal issue that you want to do from the civil society point of view. Uh, try to uh, work with what's there and design programs that support. There's um, Actually, I have two papers there. I didn't mention this other one, but there's one that's written, and that one's in German and in English. That one's written for NGOs, and it's about how to partner with companies. And so that might be really helpful. And that's a whole other discussion. I teach that at Georgetown University. And the other side is very interesting. But I don't think I, I, most successful cases aren't new NGOs. It's usually old NGOs or you know, semi-old operating in new ways. Because there is an advantage to being established with the issue and so on. So if, 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 I would start there rather than inventing something new. You were talking about um, maximizing inc uh, outcome yeah. for, um, for those uh, corporations, and especially for Patagonia. I was wondering how um, does Patagonia or does the, uh, the public measure this outcome? Right. How do you define the outcome? Yeah, right. Um, well, there's two places for outcomes. One is the business, because remember, it needs to serve the business, and then the other is society. So um, companies are actually uh, pretty good at measuring the business outcomes in general. So like, what sorts of things happen out there that will increase somebody's ability to work with other um, cultures? Um, you know, what, which salespeople are most effective. Uh, companies are generally pretty, pretty good, as you know. Oddly enough, <laughs> because we, we have isolated the corporate community involvement function and treated it like a charity, a lot of companies don't measure the business outcomes of their corporate community involvement. But usually it's, the, it's a case of of using what the company measures in other areas. So one company I, I've worked with is um, UL Underwriters Laboratories. Um, they're mostly a US company, but what they do, they're the ones that put the seals of, like a, a little seal on your toaster, and the seal tells you that the toaster is not gonna explode and burn your hair off when you use it. You know, there it's, it's a safety seal. Um, and they, um, we did. We I started working with the corporate community involvement on measuring whether their program increased employee productivity, employee engagement, and therefore revenue. And um, it, you know, once we got HR involved, human resources, it was actually pretty simple to measure because they had already done this in other areas. So when it comes to business outcomes, it's usually a matter of taking what the company does elsewhere. When it comes to social return on investment or um, social outcomes, that's a whole different story. And um, I, you know, I teach that at Georgetown, and I think that we are in, we aren't very developed in measuring societal outcomes. N neither is civil society, but companies aren't either. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. I think the main reason is actually historical. The main reason is that. When, um, when the, the NGO sector, when civil society was created and philanthropy was created in the US with the Rockefellers and the Fords and all of those foundations, and the government started all these programs in the 1930s to deal with these societal issues, it didn't occur to anybody that 
looking at a problem and coming up with a reasonably sound design to take care of it wouldn't eliminate it. It was like, of course we can get rid of poverty, you know, in 10 years and 15 years and one generation. Of course we can, every child will be able to read if we just give them books and we tell the teachers to make them read the books. So it really wasn't until the 1970s when we realized, and it was sort of a rude awakening, you know, bah, bah, you know that it was very hard, it was uh, that these problems were very tenacious and it was very hard to solve them. So I know the 1970s sounds like a really long time to you all, but, um, but that's really, you know, that's 40 years ago. So really evaluation didn't even exist until 40 years ago and that's just when it came into being. It wasn't until 20 years ago that people really started talking about it. So my view is that we, we don't have many, there isn't a whole lot of measurement going on and most companies are not measuring the social impact or the social return on investment. And I think all of society is, not, is basically failing at this, including government. Um, so I think we need to change our thinking around it. We, we got used to not measuring it because it was charity and because of course it was going to work and you don't, you, don't, you don't scrutinize a gift and it's a little bit, you know, if somebody donates their time or somebody donates money, you don't want to go and tell them your money didn't do any good. So I think there's some of that. Um, and, and so we've gotten into this pattern of we start things in civil society and then we decide, oh, maybe we should measure if it works which is really backwards because if you think of the corporate sector, I mean, no company would ever, you know, I mean, BMW would never put a car on the road unless they're sure that it runs. <laughs> um, you know, you do all the testing to make sure something works before you create it. So while in the corporate sector, for other areas, not corporate community involvement, but for, you know, product development or training or marketing, we routinely spend more money on measurement than on the thing itself, than on the marketing ad or on the product itself, developing the product itself until we're sure it works. We might spend 90% of the budget on that until it works. You know, the first time, the, the first years of developing a new product are testing and measuring and see if it works. In civil society, we think that spending 20% of a budget on evaluation is outrageous. You know, all these kids aren't going to get services if you spend that much on creating a tome that's going to... So I think we have to change our thinking and just be willing to invest a lot of money early on, um, even if it means offering fewer services, um, and then figure out what really works. So there has to be some kind of measuring because there are all those indices like like that like Dow Jones Sustainability Index and yeah. so why would uh, a big corporation do a lot of effort to do some society uh, some um, society um, responsibility program if they cannot prove by numbers that it actually does have an outcome? I think there's some measurement on the business side. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's a lot in the societal side. And most of those measurements are not outcome. So an outcome, by outcome I mean, so what? You know, did something really change there? Most of those measurements are uh, what are, you know, called outputs or accomplishments. So how many people were there and how many dollars and, you know, they don't answer if poverty really went down. They don't answer if more children were able to read. They don't answer if, you know, really you can take a species off the environmental, you know, uh, off the endangered species list. They just answer, like, what was the, the amount of effort, but not whether it made a difference. So on the, did it make a difference? I don't, there's very little going on from the corporate side, and there's actually very little going on from the NGO side, too, unfortunately. There's some exceptions. Health is an exception. Education is an exception. And um, I think there's a lot more measurement happening there, but there's a lot more to do. So hopefully when you're done with this series, we'll have all of that solved, right? So do we have time for one more? Should we? One more, yeah. 
Um, on the corporate side, have there been added any uh, evaluations whether um, the corporate involvement changed like the revenue or um, any other effectiveness uh, yeah. factors within the company? Um, yes, there are, um, there are several examples. Um, the UL example I just talked about, so you, and this is public, which is why I can share this. So UL knows um, that every time they take an employee and they involve them in their signature volunteer event, so this is the very well-designed one that would be on the top right of that quadrant, uh, which is a safety program. It's called Safety Ambassadors. They take an employee and they involve them in their Safety Ambassador program. For every 100 employees that they involve in the Safety Ambassadors program, seven of them will increase their level of engagement with the company. And engagement is a very specific term, which a lot of you may be familiar with. But basically, it means that an employee is willing to do more for the company than what the job requires. And there are all sorts of studies that link engagement to revenue. Um, so they know that um, seven will increase their engagement, which is actually huge because the level of engagement at UL is already very high. So to get another seven to go up is huge. Those seven employees, seven out of 100, that their level of engagement goes up, then produce more revenue. And, when, and, and they know this from other studies. Um, so that increased revenue compared to what you put into the program is, a, is an annual return of investment of over 150%. For every $1 that they put into, or one euro, that they put into the program, then they're gonna get $1 and, you know, more than $1.50 back at the end of the year, which is a hugely, you know, positive return on investment. So that's one example. There are also lots of examples from cause marketing so, um, uh, and I, I, I don't have one that I know I can share publicly, but, um, but there are lots of examples of um, uh, marketing a product in a way that also tells them about a nonprofit or gives money to a nonprofit that increases sales. It's a good German example. It's a WWF and Combo. It's a, um, oh. it's a brewery, and they, they sell um, crates of beer, and every crate of beer, a uh, um, certain percentage. Um, of that went to a rainforest uh, protection program. Okay, and their so, sales went up. Yeah. Great. That's a great example. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. I have to go get some. <laughs> That's great. I think there's one right behind you. And um, yeah, I want to come back to your German, to, to the Mittelstand, uh -huh. um, because I was thinking about that. Yeah, lots of um, big international uh, corporations are. Uh, doing the, the CSR um, things and stuff, but um, what about the middle stand? What, what do you see? What development is there and um, what possibilities is there to, to get these um, uh, corporates? Um, yeah, um, I, I see, well, as is the case commercially, <laughs> I think the innovation comes from the middle and smaller companies more than the large companies. So um, I, I use you know, sometimes people accuse me, it's like, well, you're always talking about big companies, and, and, and that, whatever reason, I didn't ask for this, but my clientele tends to be the big companies. Um, but also in part because I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining what a company does. Like, I just had to do that with UL, and they're actually a pretty small company, so they, they would qualify as a mid-sized company. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining what the company is before I get to it. Well, if I put, you know, if I put... Bayer Crop Science up there. You guys immediately know who that is. But um, I, I actually think that um, I, routinely I will, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll bring me in as a speaker somewhere and they'll say, you know, B has worked with large companies and is doing all these innovative things. And, and so I will go somewhere and speak about and I don't want to, you know, uh, belittle what <laughs> my clients are doing, but, you know, speak about what FedEx is doing and Disney is doing. And then somebody will raise their hand in the room and they'll say, 150 employee operation here, and we do this. And do you think this is a good idea? And the this that they describe is so much better than any of the examples I gave. So um, I think that there's a little bit less pressure 
to do it. Um, in some, I mean, there's always local pressure. You know, you always have the local social club that needs uniforms or whatever. There's that sort of pressure. But I think because Fortune 500s are in the news so often and uh, they're just more public or just any large company, um, there's more sort of um, kind of environmental pressure to do something. So some middle, so all the large companies are doing something. I think some of the mid-size or smaller companies aren't doing anything. There are still some that aren't because they don't absolutely have to. Um, but I, I still think that um, most of them, the majority, are doing corporate community involvement and they're coming up with, they can move quicker, they can change things, um, they don't have to respond to shareholders really often or not in the same way because they're privately held. So I think there are great innovations coming from from uh, smaller companies, mid-sized companies. But anybody have another example? That was a great one. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I have myself, I have a question. Sure. Um, so I, I was wondering, um, what about corporations? I don't know, for example, producing weapons. Yeah. About these ones. They, yes. They're not, they're okay, they can do something good, but can they do something good that is related to the? Yeah. I I don't know. Um, yeah, there. Are, um, that's a great question, um, and I think I have to go. So. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we out of time? Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. What I will say is that. Um, I think you can choose, you know, the, the religious traditions have two philosophies. It depends which, re, which religion, you know, and, 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 uh, and, you know, even within religions, they have, you know, several, you know, uh, areas that, that contradict each other on this. So one philosophy is that, you know, you don't go anywhere near, the, you know, the devil. It's like if something bad's happening, you know, you, 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 you know, this is a worldly thing, and you you get away and you go to heaven. You know that sort of example. The other tradition is um, you sh you know you show up and um, and and uh, you know there's a reason for why that is happening, and um, and you try to help and you change them. So um, I think we all have to make our decisions for ourselves on this. I, I was asked early on when I started doing this 10 years ago, and I'm, I'm not going to mention the company, but you know, a company that everybody considers is, is, is like bad news. You know, if you ask 99% of the people on the planet, what do you think of this company? They would say, you know, they're, they're, they're evil. Uh, what, what will you do when they call and ask for your help? And I said, you know, I don't know. I didn't know at the time. Now they haven't asked for my help. They're not on my client list. But I have had other companies that I was very concerned with what they were doing, and I chose the second path. I said, you know what? You know, if I really believe this, that one department at a time, we can change the way this works, then maybe I have stumbled on the mechanism so that you know, this com you know, a company can actually change, it, decide to change its product line. It hasn't happened yet, but... Um, and do, you know, stop doing what it does commercially that does damage. Because it doesn't even have to be the product line. It, it, it might be, you know, the way it treats employees. So that's another issue I run into, you know. So I help with the community involvement, and, I'm look, and I see these employee practices that, you know, don't really live up to the broader sense of corporate citizenship. So um, I, I think... I think um, there's, for me, there's no clear answer, and everybody answers it uh, differently. I don't know that it makes sense to, uh, but the way I've answered it is, well, at least if I'm working with them, then I can um, can change them from the inside. Now, I haven't worked with, you know, any, you know, any defense contractors um, or tobacco company, you know, the ones that are kind of traditionally considered um, to be doing more harm than good with their commercial products. So I haven't had that situation completely. 
But um, yeah, let me know if you come up with the answer. Because <laughs> I'm just, you know, I, I, and I have had ethical dilemmas it, with companies that you wouldn't think, where I'm in a room and somebody basically says, we, you know, this is not the best thing for this health issue. Um, but um, but it's what we need to do if we if we want to you know if for the good of the company, and you know so to me that's an ethical dilemma where you know they're they're choosing now in this case they weren't choosing to do something that was bad for people's health but it wasn't as good as a different path you know it was between two different programs and they chose the program that did more good for them than for the health as, I mean as it turned out I objected a little bit and then my my contact there objected a little bit, and then we actually came up with a third program, which is better than the first two anyway. So um, this is not for the faint at heart. There are ethical dilemmas like every step of the way, and there's no road map. So you kind of have to you know, work your way through it. But I'm really glad you're thinking of that. Yeah. So that was a very long way of saying I don't know. 